Good. So we're live on YouTube now as well. That's good. Okay, so we'll start in about four minutes. Okay. <clears throat> As, as we say, it's a presentation by the three of us, but I was volunteered to be uh, lead uh, key presser for this uh, <laughs> first nice half hour. Yeah. And then we'll, uh, we have a, uh, like 15 minutes or so lead in for Bill to cover his uh, spectroscopy. Good stuff. <laughs> so um, what time do you, are you planning to to finish because it's good to have some time for questions at the end well, certainly plan the first part to be the video meteor detection for half an hour mm -hmm. and then to build say 15 minutes or so okay and so to finish say quarter to ten to with the with the talk side okay so yeah if you could try and finish by say quarter two that gives yep. us 15 minutes for questions then we're saying for that, yes, it's not going to be an evening with Ken Dodd, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. Yeah. How's your weather been recently in Leeds, Alex? Uh, well, it's there's been several days and nights of heavy fog. Mm. So, uh, yes, yeah, so some nights got good visibility for an hour after sunset. Yeah. And then the temperature <clears throat> conditions change, all the damp brings in, and, and it's categories of fog and mist. Yeah, similar with me. I did have um, something like 1,200 captures on the night of the 5th of November, though. Yeah. It, it did <laughs> involve a, a lot of effort going through to get rid of them all. <laughs> yeah, they're the, uh, what are they, the Catherine Inns and the uh, yeah, that's Arguer right. Inns. All of those. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I had a clear spell for a while last night because I was uh, doing some uh, imaging of Mars. All right. Yeah. But my seeing wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was clear here briefly last night, but it was one of those frustrating nights where it was clear for a little while and then it clouded over and then it cleared up a bit and then it clouded over. <clears throat> Yeah, that's it. And then you can get very, very thin, high cloud. It uh, depends what you're doing. Anybody doing photometry or whatever may, may curse it, but uh, yeah. general viewing, it's not bad. Sometimes it's quite good for seeing as well if you get a bit of fog, doesn't it? Yes. <clears throat> so I remember the... Uh, <clears throat> solar observing and the solar observers, they would like to get the, uh, the sun, say, in a, in a cool morning in October, September, October, when mm. the air was much more still. Yeah, yeah, before it had a cool. chance to start okay. convection. There's no boiling conditions on the disk. <laughs> okay, so we've, uh, we've reached uh, seven o'clock, so we'll get underway. Um, so I'm really pleased tonight that we have a triumvirate of, uh, of meteor observers, uh, some of the leading meteor observers in the country who are going to talk about modern methods of meteor observing. So um, uh, William Stewart and Alex Pratt are both leading uh, figures in the nematode network and Bill Ward has done some really pioneering work on meteor spectroscopy. So hopefully over the next 45 minutes, uh, we'll learn a lot about how to detect meteors and also how to to determine what they are made of. Um, so I'll hand over to Alex now and then I believe Bill's going to be coming on in about half an hour. So Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So the first slide has come through hopefully. Um, <clears throat> yes, the solar system is uh, littered with large amounts of debris from asteroid and cometary material. And here's a schematic showing the Earth doing its tour around the sun and passing a, uh, an arc of material. And we can see here that it is from Comet Halley. When she lays down its streams of debris, its materials, it passes near the sun, it drops it off like a rickety dust cart and gives us the uh, Eta Aquarids in May and the Orionid meteors in October, as we have just been observing them. 
but uh, I hope these little videos are playing. So. <clears throat> yeah, they look fine. Uh, They've come through all. fine. So what happens when these meteoroids, as they're whizzing around the solar system, if they collide with the Earth's atmosphere at the high velocities incurred, they vaporize at high altitude. The small particles, like tiny dust grains, some can be the density of your breakfast cereal. They can give meteors of fifth, fourth, third, second magnitude. But the larger bodies, uh, they will then lead to the negative magnitude. And that's in the lower video where it's fragmenting, breaking apart. And clearly the stony, stony ions, <coughs> excuse me, those with a higher density will get further down into the atmosphere. <clears throat> How can you visualize these velocities? Well, as, as a youngster, I had a model of the Blackbird reconnaissance plane and it ran at uh, Mach 3 whizzing across high altitude surveillance, which equates to about one kilometer per second, which I can visualize that kind of speed. And if you go to the Science Museum, you can see Apollo 10 command module came into the top of the atmosphere, 25,000 miles per hour, 11 or so kilometers per second. That's harder to get your head around. But then we go up another level again to the geocentric velocity, the velocity relative to the Earth of when these particles are coming in from these streams. So here's the meteors from <clears throat> Leonids or Ionids, Perseids, etc. For example, the very fast Leonids, 70 kilometers per second, 70 times the speed of the Blackbird. It's hard to get your head around. And then even the slow, so-called slow meteors, the Taurids, Geminids, about 30 times the speed. And as we all know, if you want to see which meteor showers are on display or favored for this month, there's material you can look at like the BAA's Meteor Diary in the handbook, IMO's Meteor Calendar, and many other sources. These are derived from the major streams which are cataloged by the IAU Meteor Data Center. Also in here, they have a working list of hundreds of streams, hundreds of meteor showers, which have been detected or are awaiting further confirmation. In the old days, here's our late friend Melvin showing you how to observe meteors visually. And you'd sit out with a deck chair and a torch, notepad, log the meteors coming across, send in the forms later to the BTA, <coughs> meteor section of the BAA, might run a film camera, these days you'd run a DSLR, preferably a rotating shutter, then the, the gaps in the trail indicate it was a fast meteor rather than a plane or a satellite. And this is William's slide. We're saying, is visual work now redundant? We have all this technology. Well, no, because the visual records link back to uh, the last few hundred years of visual work and we can do comparative studies. Otherwise, we overlook long-term trends. And because of the gravitational pull of large bodies like Jupiter, these meteor streams are changing in your lifetime. Remember, the, the Perseids used to be the strongest meteor shower of the year. Now they're not quite as powerful, and it's the Geminids which have moved into position. So just one or two fun slides. Visual watching was fun. We've all done it over the years. But uh, it can leave you very, very tired at work after those late hours. You, you'd be perishing cold in, in the cold and damp. We are concerned with light pollution, insecurity lights, as I call them, from neighbors and commercial properties. Uh, you might be concerned on personal safety if you're there the early hours and there's someone comes by who isn't a meteor observer. My visual acuity isn't good, so visual isn't the best method for me. So what, what do we have in video technology? And this is just a, a very brief list of which software is available. <clears throat> like at the top, Handy AVI. Uh, this produces little clips. It monitors the sky with a analog camera or IP security type camera. 
checks for any movement and records a little clip for you. Great fun. It's fairly low cost, but as far as I know, you can't get the data and integrate it into sharing with networks by triangulation. I won't describe all these others, but Metric is uh, needs a special card in the PC to work. Others, CAMS UFO capture. These take analog cameras with motion detection software. New developments we have based on the Raspberry Pi, the very inexpensive, powerful little microcomputer. Global Meteor Network have a nice solution. Dominic Ford BAA is developing Meteor Pi. And uh, <clears throat> I think it's Mike Hankey, American Meteor Society with All Sky 6. So William's slide of uh, UFO capture motion detection. It's developed by Sonatico, a group in Japan, unfortunately at cost to, to license. So standard definition, about 150 pounds. You can see here you have a little like a Watek low light video camera, a fast lens, pop them into a housing, get an old computer out of the garage that's been set aside. It will suffice for dedicated running of this software. And here on Williams Outbuilding, he's got a nest of uh, housings monitoring the sky. Quick overview of the cameras. <clears throat> uh, preferably for this type of software with UFO capture or cams, an analog camera, mono. Don't use an integration mode, have it running at real time speed. Uh, there's quite a range of models available, like the Watek range. I think Gemwak is generic within Watek. There's Mintrons. Others are makes are available. Thirty pounds up to three, four, five hundred if you wish to spend so much. As for the lenses, on the second-hand market and online, there's a lot of CCS mount lenses which were from old video cameras from the old 16 mil. Cine days. These fit very well. So focal lens, 4 mil up to 12 mil, give you field of view 100 to say 30 degrees. Try to get a fastest focal ratio if you can obtain one. There's other models, aspherical models, which give very wide uh, coverage and sharp images across the whole field. Computer, Cosmic R, there's zoom lenses you can use. So yet again, not too expensive. And as we mentioned, just get an old computer, which you've put out to pasture. Okay, I, I run an old XP box, two XP boxes and a Vista. Uh, as long as there's enough memory and CPU power to run uh, Windows and this dedicated application, don't run it for anything else, but uh, at least it will find some use. Um, we recommend a decent size hard disk drive to store all the video capture data. Some people build them and have a separate disk for the operating system you don't need to do, and you don't need to go to solid state. For the capture between the video camera and coming into the computer, <clears throat> Two options, a PC video capture card, Osprey, Osprey 210 is a good performer. Also, there's lots of options with USB video grabbers. It again, low cost, but it, it all adds up when you, you put it together. And then when you are recording to the computer, you want to know it's going to be accurate time. It doesn't need to be to milliseconds accuracy or even really tenths of a second. So the Windows time service, which is built in, is good. It's a shame at the moment it doesn't allow you to set it, as far as I know, for two or three checks per day. So the software like Dimension 4 does a very simple internet check of time. You can have that running, say, every 15 minutes. You could set Windows NTP to do it yourself or Mindberg software. As long as you're getting fairly accurate time on the computer. And also with a camera, 
that if it has, let's say, auto iris lens, when you switch off the power, it will then close and protect the sensor. So it's a good idea to have uh, a daytime, nighttime switch. And if it's linked to uh, the seasons, all the better. How's the camera in a weatherproof enclosure? You feed 12 volts to it. You might want a heater to save it uh, misting, chewing up, but uh, once the camera's going, it's warm, it usually does the trick. And putting bags of silica gel desiccant does help. And yet again, there's William's example on the outbuilding. Alternatively, you could have an indoor video camera. This is my north facing camera in the front bedroom. Just keep it dark on there, no, no lights. Um, tripod with the camera slightly tilted about 30 or 40 degrees. And through the double glazing, it's recorded good data for a few years. Whether you use UFO capture or the RMS Pi solution, many of them require you to have a rock solid mounting for the camera so nothing moves at all. And then it requires you to build a profile. So here you have your latitude and longitude and altitude of your camera station, a station ID or camera name. They usually require you to build a registration profile. So this is what UFO calls its scintillation masks, which identify the stars on the videos. And then it has an internal star catalog and you register those, you overlap them. I think you can see there the blue blobs overlapping. So you've come, it's like, a, in a way, like an astrometric, astrometric alignment. And uh, in the bottom, you can see a little graph and that's a magnitude relationship which you build so the software can have an estimate or in sometimes a guess at the magnitude of the meteor. With the UFO analyzer, you run against all the clips. It uh, checks them against the star background. It checks against a catalog of active meteors. And in the sort of third middle column, it tells you if they're Perseids or Geminids or Kappa Cygnids. Uh, in the case, I just mentioned with the RMS Global Meteor Network solution, you don't have to do this. It, it nicely does it all automatically within the coding. From the UFO software, we create a CSV file, which contains one entry for each meteor. And you can probably see all along the columns, there's loads of data with the magnitude, duration, hour, minute, second, RA, deck, um, number of reference stars, etc., And we collect these from our various observers. As a side-by-side -side comparison with the Raspberry Pi, solution from Global Meteor Network, and that's their uh, URL at the bottom. It's nicely free, open source software, runs on low cost hardware, like the Pi 3, Pi 4. That's mine in the main screen, and you can see it against the mouse, how tiny this little computer is. I applied heat sinks and a little fan sitting on a plastic card sheet, a real time clock, to maintain the time when the unit is switched off. And hidden in the side is a tiny slot to take micro SD card. This one has a 128 gig, so that's easily enough space to take the RMS image, which is the copy of all the RMS coding software to drive the meteor detection, and also plenty of space to store your meteor data. Some of the components for this solution a transformer plug to provide power over Ethernet because it connects via Ethernet cable to the item on the right, which is an IMX IP internet protocol board camera, which I understand is the same or very similar to what you have in many security cameras. And for just 30 odd pounds, it comes with a four mil or six mil lens, which is the, uh, the main workhorse of the network. Bottom left, you can see it being assembled into a housing. On their website, they have lots of tutorials and uh, wiki and a meteor forum to help everyone and to discuss how to put things together. 
So you can build it yourself for 150 pounds. We've put one or two together now and myself and William are running uh, two. We've got others about to go and we're just comparing how they work against UFO system. Uh, as a ready built, you can pay 400 pounds from GMN. The system needs good broadband connection because after it's processed your data, it can upload 100 meg up to 500 meg or even more to their server. One downside is it needs at least 20 field stars in the video field of view before it will accept it for meteor detection. So on some misty nights, UFO capture will beat it. And at the moment, if there's any swift moving clouds which are illuminated by local lighting, it can cause hundreds and thousands of false detections. But otherwise, it's a good system. Here's a comparison. The top is my RMS camera. The bottom is UFO capture of a meteor popping across Orion. These videos should start running. And you can see they give comparative performance. But for the cost of the RMS uh, solution and the lenses, the image quality is superb that it gives. <clears throat> and you get nice quality uh, astrometry from them. A quick distraction into meteor triangulation as to why we do it. So here's our, on the left is our friend Don, and he's got meteor camera. He sees a meteor there, but he's not sure how near it, because he's got a two dimensional view as a single observer. So was it coming towards him? Was it away? Was it nearby? I can't be sure. But his best friend, Joe, he also has a video camera. And likewise, he's not sure are they coming near, are they coming further away? Nice graphic by William, I must say this. And then they team up, they monitor the same part of sky. And uh, from this, we can work out the ground track of the meteor, its extinction, its detection height, its magnitude, or perhaps its orbit. And as far as the nematode group are concerned, this is the same with all the meteor stations here. These are the alignments, and we can see the ground track submitted to the end of September. Take the stations off the screen, there we are, that's better. An example of partner working, this is with uh, Ray Taylor, Skirlo, and we recorded a uh, meteor of magnitude minus seven absolute magnitude. That's a normalized magnitude it would have if it was 100 kilometers above the observer in the zenith. And it was detected about 100 kilometers up, descended down to about 72, 73. The UFO software gave us a radiant plot, suggested it was perhaps an alpha Capricornid, quite slow meteors. And we got a solar system orbit which confirmed very similar to the elements for the alpha caps, but some interesting differences as well. I won't have a long on this, but it's just to show what we can do with some of the data once it's collated from groups of people. And this is multi-year analysis using the absolute magnitudes. So as I say, that's a normalized magnitude as to what it would be above you in the zenith at 100k. So way over on the right, absolute mags of three or four. These are tiny specks of grains coming in, not putting on much of a display. But as we move over to the left, we have, what do we have? A difference of 10, 11, 12 magnitudes. So what's that 10,000s or more difference in brightness? So over on the left, these must be the large bodies which are coming in. And on the right, you can see the legend at the top of it is the Leonids at 70 kilometers per second. They're shown as the open circles all along the top at about 120 kilometers where they're detected. And then down the slow objects, which are the, these reddish and these browny ones, they are then they're the Geminids and the northern and southern Taurids, and they're detected at about 90 or so kilometers. 
So it looks like a, a layered cake as to what we have. And uh, yes, when you read the literature and they say meteors are detected at a certain height, it's a generalization. You have to be aware that according to their velocities and their sizes, they segregate out into these categories. And likewise, this is the extinction. So this is where we, the last time, <clears throat> the last point at which we see them and can triangulate the altitudes. And uh, <clears throat> So quick summary, the open circle Leonids and Perseids, they're burning up quite high, 80, 90, 100 kilometers in the atmosphere. But the denser material and slower material, like the Geminids and, and the, uh, the Taurids, they're getting down to 60, 50, and 40 kilometers. Uh, you've seen this uh, slide shown by various people at talks, it's, it's, it's a very popular thing to do. It's an all sky map of all the meteor radiance, of all meteors detected, uh, plotted as RA and DEC. Uh, you will see that uh, there's few radiance below about minus 30 declination. That's uh, what you would expect from a meteor group in the British Isles. On the right is a color code, and it shows that the, uh, the purplish Meteors are the fastest at 70 odd kilometers. So this might be them here, this might be the Leonids. But if we take away the twig out well, the sporadics, we can see a bit more wood for trees and there's some grouping and clustering there. If we now pop the, the names on, we can identify the major showers, like the Perseids, the greeny color coded slower Geminids, Below them, the fast Orion is, which we've just been uh, observing. And this twin band to their right of the northern and southern Taurids, quite slow. If I do another visualization with an ecliptic type plot, we can see, well, apart from the northern declination showers, they're all sort of traversing right to left. And it's because they're following the plane of the ecliptic. And this is the effect we get because the, the Earth is moving around the sun. As we are viewing the night sky, we are passing through or near one of these meteor streams, and it appears to toddle along through the constellation of Orion or Perseus, which gives it its name. And from this, we, we can estimate when the uh, ma maximum activity will occur for a meteor shower. <coughs> Pardon me and also the expected drift per day. There's some quick schematics to show the northern torrids. These are more or less in the plane of the uh, Earth's orbit, it's inclined only three degrees, quite slow meteors, about 30 kilometers per second. Long duration shower, because at the, the top left diagram, you can see that it takes the little blue dot of the Earth weeks to pass through them. <coughs> That's why they last so long. As contrast to speed, we have the Leonids. Excuse me, I'll just a quick drink. Leonids are our high speed members of the major showers of the year. 70 kilometers per second. The Earth is moving there in the top diagram anticlockwise. The Leonids are clockwise. We hit them more or less head on. So it's a high speed collision. Geminids are much slower. We'll see these in December. <coughs> and because they are, they are slow, our video meteor systems can get good measures of their velocity. And so the orbits are a lot better quality ellipse. It's able to measure the semi-major axis a lot better. As we come to the new year, we have the quadrantids. These are a short-lived maximum. And you can see up from the diagram, you visualize that it's sweeping up and down onto the Earth, inclined at 71 degrees. This is why the shower radiant appears to come from Boötes, the old mural quadrant. 
And that, visualize, that visualization there shows you the solar system orbit and how it relates back to the constellation map. And just to come to the end now of the summary, for Global Meteor Network, all their data is made publicly available. So in the links on their website, you can get access to the data under a Commons license free to use. You can see their radiant maps, radiant plots, and the data which is sent every day by everyone. There's examples in the lower part of the screen where they combined to provide orbital data of each multi-station meteor. As far as a nematode group, we followed Sonatico's uh, Japanese model on their website. And after they process their annual data, they uh, make it available. So we have links there to our data sets. So if anyone wants to do analysis or data mining, they can download them. Uh, must admit, we've yet to publish our 2019 data. I'm waiting for some more to come through. Either way, we will publish what we have before the end of the year. And on the website, there's lots of hints and tips for anyone, uh, guides, uh, user guides. Uh, and we have a chat forum as well. And this summarizes some of the articles which we've sent in to the BAA journal, etc. So I hope that's been a useful quick fly through there. And we are going to lead into our expert on meteor spectroscopy, Bill Ward, who can show you can take it to an even higher level to get more science from your video cameras. Okay, thanks, Alex. Uh, that was excellent. And good evening, everybody. This will be a very brief introduction just to the basics. I'm often asked how you go from the picture to a spectrum. So this will just outline the few basic steps and give a few pointers on the way. Because whilst meteor spectroscopy is extremely easy to do, you just stick a grating in front of the lens, it's an absolute minefield thereafter to try and get some productive information from the spectrums. So next slide, please, Alex. Alex, the master of ceremonies. Yeah, evening. sorry about that. This is like the old days of the BAA where you had a projectionist, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> So, as I said, it's, it's quite straightforward to simply mount a grating uh, in front of the camera, and most of my systems use a uh, Watec 910s now. And these two pictures just show the general configuration. Uh, I use gratings uh, as opposed to prisms. Gratings have the advantage that they are essentially linear in their dispersion, whereas prisms that you sometimes see in older books, which are easier to get and cheaper at the time, are not. So when it comes to post-processing, it's, it's very difficult. You have to do lots of interpolation between different wavelength groupings, whereas a diffraction grating will produce a spectrum almost ready to go. The kind of standard that you can purchase from the various optical suppliers like Mel's Grio and Thor Labs, uh, Edmund Optics tend to be 50 millimeter square. So they fit nicely into a 72 millimeter empty filter housing, which is what I use. And then you, you can use a retaining ring just to hold the grating in place. And if you use a rotating filter holder, you can then orientate the grating to eliminate issues of local lighting and changes in the radiant altitude as evening goes on, just depending on what you're trying to do. Most of the times, though, it's best just to leave it, the axis horizontal uh, with respect to this, the sensor the pixels. OK, next, Alec. These are another couple of examples which other people are using. That's one of the uh, Williams. And again, you can see that the grating, he's got his in the, in the enclosure. Uh, I tend to use mine just out in the open and kind of in the shelter of uh, uh, the back of the house uh, to try and minimize what we're now looking at is you can do it through glass, but if you get brighter meteors, sometimes you can get internal reflections and you get multiple spectrums and it gets kind of difficult to, to deconvolve it all. So I like just the, the grating to be exposed to the sky directly. Okay, next Alex. This is a video that Alex got off of YouTube of an exceptional fireball I've got five years ago already. And that basically illustrates what you see uh, on the, the video capture. 
trying to observe that visually as historical observers did is almost unimaginable, uh, whereas we have the luxury of being able to slow things down, excuse me, and then analyze it much more closely and watch the evolution of the spectrums, watch how the fireball changes through its different phases as it fully ablates into to the, the atmosphere. And this was one of the first times that the, the, the split in the spectrum had actually been uh, observed in almost real time. Uh, so you can actually see the, the, the differences in the spectrums between the, the fireball and the post-fireball stage, and this reflects the changes in the energy as the fireball is ablating and the, the temperatures and overpressures are changing. And when you look at the, the integrated composite, it gives a beautiful impression of all the, the, the lines and the spectrum, and that's what, that's what we're after. So th this is just hopping through all the stages in, in the video. Uh, so once you correct for all the instrumentation sensitivity and wavelength calibration, you end up with a, a really nice uh, spectrum telling you what the meteor is made of. Uh, and that's, that's quite a significant jump. Spectroscopy, spectroscopy has been around for a long time, but we've never ever been able to produce as many spectrums as we can now, which gives us a whole new insight into the taxonomy of, of the meteors. I predicted, uh, probably when I kicked ticked off doing this a long time ago, that the most interesting ones actually would be the sporadics, and that's actually proved to be the case, I think. Uh, this was initially thought to be a, a southern torrid, simply because the time of year and the a general orientation, but as we will see, it's not at all as it seems. So you catch your spectrum, what do you do? How do you get from the picture to the graph? Next, Alec. So you have your, your spectrum image. Uh, generally, the spectrum needs to run from left to right, short to long, in terms of wavelength. And that's just, just, just so that you, you can visualize the, the, the color sweeping from the blue through the yellow, uh, green out to the, the red and then the infrared. But it's very difficult to work with a spectrum like that. So generally you have to do some uh, graphical image processing to get it into a forum that you can then import into the actual, the actual sorry, spectrum processing software. So next, Alec. So what we're actually talking about here, well, the diffraction grating disperses the light into the various wavelengths that are present in the original spectrum. This is a little graphic I made using a small mercury lamp and just took a picture of it with a plastic grating stuck in the front of it, because that's essentially what you're doing. It's very straightforward. And the idea is that you can measure from the zero order image, the number of pixels along to lines that you can positively identify and there's some uh, numerical examples there that allows you to calculate what the wavelength dispersion is. Then if we, if we see unknown lines, we know what the dispersion is across the spectrum. Therefore, we can actually use that to work back and identify uh, lines that are not immediately obvious. And as we'll see, things have developed dramatically over the past couple of years and just in terms of the technology. So that the actual spectrums we can work with now are just astonishing. So that's the principle behind it. Uh, it's, it's really very, very straightforward. Next, Alex. This is a kind of simpler spectrum, uh, which was of a Perseid, uh, what's that, 2014, six years ago, my goodness. And 90% of the time, I reckon you don't actually have the zero order, which is the first problem you have to try and overcome. Because if you don't have the zero order, and even if you know the dispersion, what's your starting point? So by good fortune, many meteors have similar prominent lines. So once you can identify common patterns, because that's the, I think that's the simplest way to do it, you can then sort of work backwards using the process of identifying lines, determining the dispersion, and then using it to identify lines you're not so sure about. Because the Perseids are rather rapid, they produce these, I call it the no-known group, which is atmospheric nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. And these are atmospheric emissions in the, in the near infrared. The, the brightest line in the spectrum, that O oxygen line, is at 777.4 nanometers. And that's, that's a lifesaver on occasions. But you don't see that on slow meteors, so swings and roundabouts. So you need to rely on just finding known identifiable lines 
through a sort of pattern recognition, if you will. Uh, that, that's the only really way you can do it without having the zero order. So we have our picture. Next slide, Alex, please. Next one, I think. That, that's it. So in order to get the image processing uh, to produce what you want to produce to import into the spectrum processing software, you need to do some uh, geometric adjustments. So from the original sort of slanted image, you have to then rotate the, the image and then de-slant it. Now I use Iris, which is the free software package uh, by Christian Buell in France. And it's, it's, it's fabulous, it really is fantastic. It can do a lot more than, than just these geometric uh, transformations. There's also a program from America called RSpec, I believe, which allows you to do this semi-automatically. You can import the picture and then you sort of drag a rotate and slant slider in the little graphic and it allows you to do that. That's, that's quite convenient at times. But it's often when you're working with Spectrum that you're not so sure about, it's actually better to do it manually because it gives you a better feel for what you're actually working with. Next, Alex. Uh, then you crop it down uh, to just the spectrum that you want to analyze because there's then a binning process. But watch out for stars because they can they, they, they appear as uh, artifacts and false spectrum lines when you do the binning and integrate up the lines. And the other thing to remember is that if you're setting a system up, you need to focus on the spectrum, not on the stars. By the nature of diffraction, it rotates the focal plane by a degree related to the number of lines in the actual diffraction grating. Most gratings are 300 lines per millimetre, 600, 830 and 1200. Those are the, the kind of glass uh, gratings that you can buy from these optical suppliers that I mentioned. Uh, plastic ones tend to be about 500 or 1000. So the, the greater the line count, the, kind of, the, the further you need to focus away from the image focal plane of the stars. And it's something to be very careful of. So it's a bit of a black art. Uh, if there are planets around, which are at the moment, you can actually use the planets. They're bright enough. You will actually see atmospheric absorption bands with the monochrome cameras, and you can use those to get you in the ballpark. And then you want to try and slide the focus down so the sharpest is in the kind of blue-green, the visible part, because that's where all the really interesting lines are. So once you've got the spectrum like that, transpose it into visual spec, uh, again, these operations are all done in our spec as well, but visual spec, I think, is the, is the, the better, better package. And by binning, just counting vertically, pixel column to pixel column, you then produce uh, a spectrum graph. But at the moment, it's uncalibrated and, and uncorrected, so we don't really know where we are with it. But we've got a, a handle on the, the patterns from previous experience and other published results, and we'll know that one line is magnesium, one line is sodium, oxygen, etc. So next, Alex. Putting these numbers into visual spec, uh, you produce a wavelength calibrated spectrum. Uh, identifying the other lines, uh, again, you have to compare what you have against known laboratory references. The National Institutes in the States has an enormous uh, library, uh, which is invaluable uh, if once you start to get complex spectrums. Uh, but Visual Spec has itself an inbuilt catalog, which is very useful because once you get a few of those key lines, you can just select the line you're interested in. It, they call it the Barry Center. I don't know if it's just a translation issue, the, the kind of full width half max center line. Uh, and it will tell you it could be any of these particular elements. And from then on, it's a process of elimination as to what's the most likely. Uh, it's unlikely you're going to find plutonium in your spectrum, but occasionally you, you'll get these kind of odd uh, elements appearing in the, in, the, in the actual element list. So you have to kind of balance what you're seeing with a bit of reality. It's, it's unlikely there's going to be anything too exotic, but there are 30 to 40 elements already identified in Meteor Spectra already. So there are interesting uh, discoveries still to be made. So next, Alec. To do the final calibration, uh, it's to correct for the instrument response. Most silicon detectors, uh, because of the band gap, as it's called, the way the actual silicon 
produces the photoelectrons. There's a natural sensitivity curve where the kind of near infrared through to the kind of long bit of the visible is much more sensitive to photons as is the blue. So if you divide the spectrum through by a known flux standard, it corrects for this uh, imbalance in the sensitivity. And then you start to see things like what looks like one line being less intense than the other actually is not the case. So you then, you then have a properly uh, flux, flux corrected and wavelength calibrated spectrum, and that's where we want to be. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much it. That, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a game of practice uh, here on in. Next, Alex. So visual spec has a, a feature which I particularly like because when you're describing spectrums to people, if you show them the graph, they kind of let, you know, nod, but if you actually show them a picture, they begin to understand more what they're looking at because it is more like a rainbow and you get a better feel, I think, for what the spectrum's actually telling you. And this is a colorized version of the one we've just seen. Uh, the bright green on the far left is the magnesium. The kind of yellowy line is uh, the sodium doublet, although the, sorry, the magnesium is actually a triplet. Uh, the orange line is oxygen because this per se it's very fast. The bright, intense red line is the near infrared uh, of oxygen. Visual spec scales just through the visual range. So although it's the infrared, it's just scaled as, as a red color. But I think they look fantastic and they're, they're good for demonstration purposes. So next. So where is the next step? Uh, and this is what I've been doing over the past two years. The spectrum on the screen is potentially one of the most detailed spectrum of a meteor ever captured. There are 93 discrete lines. Uh, and even within that, there are, there are several blended groups. Uh, this was a, a stony iron. And when you do a kind of comprehensive calibration and you try and narrow down little individual wavelength groupings, there are really quite unusual elements. There's a lot of tungsten, vanadium, titanium in there. So that this, this was an unusual piece of an asteroid probably, but it's entirely achievable. And the thing is, with the equipment that is available now, this is exactly the same as what's been used, used by professionals. So you can do real science, do genuine science. This, this is every bit as good as is published in any of the professional journals. Uh, you just need to be mindful of trying to make reasonable conclusions and not say that because you're seeing a very exotic line in a catalog, that's what it is. There's every possibility that it's, that it's not. Uh, iron is a Trojan horse because with its 56 electrons, there are countless thousands of transitions. So most of these lines will be iron or its near relatives on the periodic table, such as vanadium. Uh, at these higher resolutions, we are actually beginning to resolve what are just seen as single lines and very low resolution spectrums. And the good thing about that is that that allows you to identify against a subgroupings. If you look to the, in the picture on the right hand screen, there's a group of lines about the center that kind of roll off. And that's very characteristic of an iron grouping. So we can say with some certainty when we do the identification that if it's showing that pattern against the catalog, then that probably is iron. So it is, it is a probability game. Uh, and all it takes is patience and a bit of luck. Uh, the opening spectrum in the video, it's not the best spectrum in terms of detail we've got out of a spectrum, but it's probably the nicest to have beautifully framed. <laughs> so next, Alec. And ultimately, how do we tie in with the orbital stuff? And these plots here are the actual orbits of the fireball from 2015. So for the first time in a large scale, what we can now do is these spectral orbital analysis. We can actually say not only where is the orbit and what are these parameters that we can assign to the orbital track, we now know what it's made of. And that begins to allow us to see, is it asteroidal? Is it cometary? Uh, and everywhere in between, you, you get this expression in many books that you know you get stony, stony irons and irons. Well, yes, but there is a, a whole range of material in there. And for the first time, we can now actually see it. And that's that's what's exciting. It, it's uh, we're, we're changing the, the, the rules of the game because we can now go beyond simply saying, well, that's a Perseid, or that's an Orion, or that's a Leonid. We, we can look into unknown things, and the only way you can do that is by analysing the spectrum. So I think that's me, Alec, uh, just on time, and that 
colour colour synthetic spectrum there is the colourised one of the, the 93 line, uh, and that's that's about as good as it gets at the moment. So thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you both for a really good presentation. So we've got 15 minutes now for questions. Um, we've got one. Have I, sorry, Nick, have oh, I just sorry. stopped sharing? Oh, um, you can, but I, you might as well leave that picture up, Alex. It's quite a, a pretty picture. Um, okay. <clears throat> so if people want to ask questions, they can ask them via the question and answer on Zoom, or they can ask them on uh, YouTube via the, the chat. Um, so there's a question from Tim here for Bill, really. Um, and it's, is the oxygen line in your spectra caused by our atmosphere? Statistically, yes, because the elements that are in the meteorites uh, generally don't have much bonded to them. So the, the bright emission lines in the near infrared tend to be from uh, the atmosphere. Okay. Okay, that's very good. Um, yeah, and a uh, question from Steve Bosley, who, who maybe knows a thing or two about meteors anyway, but his question is, uh, what are the main differences that you have seen between different meteor showers? Now, had I been better prepared, I would have a graphic <laughs> to illustrate that perfectly. I think I actually posted it on the BAA website last year, two years ago. There's a lot of hidden information in the spectrum, apart from identifying the lines. Uh, you can see by the sort of curve of the spectrum, how fast the meteor is traveling. If there's a lot of the infrared lines, it's probably barreling in. If there's no infrared, infrared lines, it's, it's coming in nice and sedately. But the cometry, all of the, the Perseids, the Lyrids, the Leonids that have got oodles of spectrums from those uh, have relatively few of the very rocky elements and when you compare it to something like the Geminids, which is, as we know, asteroidal, you can see right away the difference in a rocky spectrum and a more friable uh, cometary fragment. And again, without doing much analysis, when, once you, you accumulate enough spectrum and enough experience, you, you can just you can see that it's, that's why I like these these synthetic ones. I, I must think about things more visually. You can see the pattern, and it gives you more clues than than just the spectrum alone actually does. So there are very clear differences which you do see. Uh, and I mean, I'm sure I put that on the BA website a graph of four showing the different because the the Leonids are very fast. Mm -hmm. Percy is a bit slower, the Lyrids, and then the Gemini is going from 70 to 35. And you can see the change in the spectrum and all the extra energy that's actually dumped into the atmosphere with the, with the Leonids barreling in at 70. They've got huge infrared excess. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's really impressive that as amateurs now, we can, we can do this. I mean, there are space missions that are going to various asteroids to pick up material from the surface and bring it back so that we can analyze it. But we're kind of doing this for free almost with-, uh, with There the was- very eminent lady scientist on Radio 4 when Rosetta was in the news and the presenter actually asked, and can you tell us what are the, what, what's the comet made of? And she says, oh, well, we, we, know, we know it's made from uh, magnesium and sodium and iron and <laughs> we can do that for the back garden. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what's the most unusual element that you've seen in your spectrum that you're sure has come from the meteoroid and, and not from our atmosphere? Well, this latest one, I have never seen so many lines that I am beginning to believe are vanadium. But this, 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 that one is an unusual one. Uh, it really is. Uh, it's, it's, it's certainly it's got the rocky elements. The, the, there's magnesium and sodium. Uh, they, they are there. So they, they, they are, they're, they're, they're components of just minerals on Earth. Uh, but these metal ones, not, not of that particular type. And as I'm saying, there certainly there was vanadium. There's certainly tungsten in it, uh, and possibly some titanium. Yeah, really interesting stuff. So a question here from Jack Martin. Uh, he says, excellent work, Bill, for your spectra. Have you tried using BAS for data reduction, which I think is a spectrum um, analysis? As indeed, uh, no, I haven't. And it's actually one of the things that myself, William and Alex were talking about preparing this, is that even if you're not really interested in, in the astronomy, uh, there is the opportunity for immense data mining here. Uh, and also, I mean, there are commercial packages available. If you, you input particular parameters, it will tell you what the lines are. Now, I don't know if they, they will work on astronomical spectra as opposed to nice, clean laboratory spectra. 
but there's, there's if, if people are, are interested in doing it, that means there are there are opportunities for for all sorts of analysis here, just going beyond the astronomy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds good. And it maybe is a, another kind of crowdsourcing thing where we can put a lot of stuff online and get people to do the analysis uh, for us. Yeah, um, that's a great point, Nick. This is William. Uh, it's a great point that, you know, because we've got a, a number of specs uh, which people all than, uh, than Bill are, are collecting. And uh, certainly we get some uh, added to the website. And if people want to download them and, and process them and, and see what they get, that's uh, that'll be very welcome indeed. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it's something we should discuss because it, it gives people a chance to do some analysis without actually having to, to set up the camera systems. Um, so maybe we'll talk about that offline and see what we can do. Um, I, oh, hang on. Uh, another question from Steve Bosley, but I'll ask mine first just to, to Alex and then we'll come to Steve's question. So Alex, um, you mentioned the GMN network, which is the new network that uh, essentially... Um, uses modern IP cameras that are very inexpensive and runs on Raspberry Pis or under Linux. Um, I know you've got experience of it and, and UFO, which is the one that a lot of us are using with analog cameras. Um, I know there are pros and cons to both. For somebody who's used UFO like me for a long time, um, how would you sell GMN as a network to go to? Well, that's a good point. Uh, um... <clears throat> Well, I would say well, was if, like we found with the UFO capture, UFO analyzer, um, unless the registration is very good and you've got good signal to noise on your video clips, when you do a UFO analyzer to process all the clips, uh, like in mine, it, it gets a 90 odd percent success. I don't have to do a lot of follow up. But some people find that if they want to get the best data out of that analyzer stage, you've got to commit hours to it. Well, the RMS system just does it automatically uh, each morning, analyzes every clip, and auto uploads them to the server. So your data is provided within hours, sharing with others. Mm-hmm. So it could, because otherwise, if you were doing two or three cameras, I've seen people uh, feeling like giving up, <laughs> or their quality of data degrades. And they've got good quality for one camera or two cameras, yeah, but they cannot get through all that data load, like you were saying with the Meteor Spectra. So you've instantly got some nice feedback, some good success, some nice results. Uh, as a Yorkshireman, it's a lot less electricity on a high <laughs> than a, an old PC. So, um, there's issues, that, like we said, the issues with the, um, the downside is, yes, it needs 20, meteor, 20 stars for reference in the field mainly because they wanted to get the very best astrometry and the best velocities from it. Mm-hmm. You can override it to get it to analyze at 10 stars, but it can collapse, the uh, The process can die. Uh, there's a negative side in that it, there's those fast moving cloud problem, which they're working on. So yes, they will solve it. Um, but, uh, Yes, uh, and of course, uh, for the price of putting together a UFO system and keeping it running, you could have two, three, or four of the uh, RMS. Yeah, I mean, one one thing I've noticed with my UFO systems, because my cameras are getting quite old now, is that the quality of the video from them is definitely degrading. They've got a lot more hot pixels than they used to have, and they definitely seem to be noisier than they used to be. So, yeah, they, they are, yes, they they can lose sensitivity. They they can degrade, and then you're finding you're recording fewer stars. It's getting noisier. You're getting more hot pixels. I mean, you, you saw on the. Uh, the side-by-side clip of the RMS camera and the UFO of that meteor above Orion. Mm. Uh, you could see the noise background on the Watek Ultimate it is all a bit scatty uh, white noise coming across part of the video, whereas with the IP camera, it just looks spotless. Yeah, so, okay. I think it's definitely definitely something I'll have to consider at some point, and it looks like a really interesting development, as you yeah. say, that 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 is going to broaden this up to a lot more people because it's much lower cost and it's much much easier yeah. to do that. we don't want you to sell the uh, gmn system because the mike hankey's old sky six or seven or whatever it is i believe that is 
similar system on like a little Linux box. Mm -hmm. I'd have to check that, I think it is. And Dominic's been doing his work on, on Pies. And yeah. so, yeah, they, these little microprocessors with, and the high quality uh, cameras. I mean, if I can just go on a minute, you mentioned the IP camera. Because of the bandwidth and the network plus configuration of the Pi, they're having to tone it down. I think it's the standard HD is 1280 by 720 or whatever they're having to run. Mm -hmm. But if, who knows, in a year or two's time, we can run it on something else, we can then ramp it up to the higher resolution that the chip camera board mm -hmm. supports. Well, I, I believe that it will run under it, under Linux Mint and Debian yep. and, and standard Linux forms. So that's, that's a, an option. Um, and then you, you may be able to run perhaps even faster frame rates to get more reliable velocities. So. Yeah. And and I think the work that people like Jim Rose doing, who I think is uh, listening to us in terms of making sure that these different networks can talk to each other is really important as well. Uh, you know, with the proliferation of different networks, we don't want to end up with little islands of people using different different standards. So that's really important. It is. It, well, we didn't have time to discuss fireballs, but, but yeah, yeah, Jim is highly involved in fireball monitoring and coordinating to get everyone to link together with fireball data and uh, yes there are ways we can extract data from our cameras like the ufo and csv files uh, cams yeah. will have a similar the gmn will also develop its own as well as its compatible ufo output mm -hmm. so yes uh, if some big fireball comes across and there's a chance of a material being dropped over the UK and British Isles, and yeah, we we all pile in. Yeah, which is really good. So I've got another question here from Steve, Steve Bosley yep. for Bill, uh, about these known on lines. Um, <laughs> Steve says, are they atmospheric telluric lines, or can you show that they're related to the meteoroid? This is one of the mines in the minefield of spectrum <laughs> deduction. Uh, the, again, it's it's a probability. The chances are they are atmospheric lines mm -hmm. because the, the minerals which may exist in space, the volatility of the individual elements would suggest that oxygen and nitrogen would probably outgas fairly rapidly billions of years ago. So it's unlikely they are actually carrying much residual oxygen and nitrogen. And what we're actually seeing is the atomic oxygen and atomic nitrogen being stimulated as the as the as the as the meteor meteorite passes through the atmosphere and causes those to become excited and then go through all our quantum transitions to give off very characteristic lines. Another good indicator that they're telluric is that with very rapid meteors, a uh, 55, 60 kilometers per second up uh, there is a very distinct transition at 557.7 nanometers, which is the forbidden oxygen line. Uh, and that's what gives many meteors the kind of green start, especially mm -hmm. during the Persian Leonids, uh, because that can only be admitted when the oxygen is in a, in a very uh, high vacuum environment, because it takes about two seconds for that quantum transition to happen. So it's indicating that it's not on the meteor or in the meteor, it's in the atmosphere, because that, that, that auction has taken that particular time to decay and then give off the emission. So the chances are they are atmospheric, but unlike laboratory work, even when you know it's coming from a shower, the, the, just the relative motion between you and the meteor, you have no prior information about the meteor out at all. And that's one of the reasons why it is almost impossible to give an absolute calibration for the radiance in you know, watts per square meter per nanometer. Uh, you can only try and get it as close as you can to a standard, relatively speaking. Uh, the, si the, em the eminent meteor astronomer, is it Peter Jeniskins? He wrote a paper a number of years back about absolute calibration, but it's ended up becoming involved in the mathematics and I'm sure ultimately there was assuming that so you're, you're right back to the beginning <laughs> I guess so, if we actually if we have triangulation data though so we have an orbit then that makes that at least uh, a tractable problem to do yeah uh, it's, it's becoming 
better are more possible, but it's still very difficult just because we, we, the other thing is that because you don't actually know what the absolute composition is to start with as well, you don't know what a lot of the transitions are going to be. Mm-hmm. And it's, in fact, it's, it's, it's related to fireballs and, and their intrinsic luminosity, uh, which is a suggestion of their mass. Uh, and there are so many variables, even in that, that it's very difficult to get an absolute mass from an observation of brightness under any circumstances. Uh, just depending on the model you use, it, it can change by a factor of 10. Okay. Uh, so a, it's, a, factor so of, a factor of 10 in astronomy is often quite good. Well, <laughs> <laughs> order of magnitude, that's the getting a Gale free card for every physicist. Yeah. Yeah, that's not, I mean, that's not bad, actually, as a starting point. Um, I've got a couple more questions. Um, and then if anyone else has got a question, then ask it now, and then we'll, we'll draw it to a close. So uh, one more from Steve Bosley, which is a bit technical. Um, I'll throw this out to all three of you. Um, he's talking about um, matches that RMS does, which is the Raspberry Pi software. He says it only matches at Q2. Is that a problem? And maybe you'd explain to us, Alex, what Q2 means. Uh, yeah, the, the UFO orbit software that Sonatico delivers has, uh, when you're matching multi-station meteors, it has checking criteria from Q0, which more or less matches anything that's within that time slot of about three or four seconds. And then to Q1, two, Q2 and three, it applies more restrictions, like the meteor must have existed a duration of more than 0.3 seconds, or it must also have a, uh, a very nice Q angle, which is the geometry between the two stations must be fairly well optimal to get a good orbit. So these are more restrictive. So the Q2, Q3 really start to tie things down. And what they depend on as well, as well as the duration of the thing, is the uh, the number of uh, reference stars in the clip, and also the uh, astrometric uncertainty, which I think is er- error one or error two in the CSV file. And you know, and that's whatever I forget now. Is it 0.01 with a 12 mil lens, and about 0.04 with a, a 4 mil lens? Well, when you use the RMS system, because it isn't part of UFO capture. It cannot use a UFO's proprietary CSV file with all of its fields. It uses Mm -hmm. another one, which is more like a minimalist. It it has quite a bit of the data in, but it's like a free license, free to use. And many other software packages use that, but it's got limited fields. So it doesn't carry over things like the astrometric error and the number of reference stars and certain other fields. Now, they're used in the calculation formulae to compute Q2 and Q3, as I, as I understand it. So when you get RMS data, and the, I've done this with Williams data, beautiful captures between our two RMS systems. There should be some good Q3s in there, but it doesn't give them. I think it's because it's failing with the, I think Steve probably knows these, QA and ED and these other parameters which Sonatico have in their manual. Mm-hmm. It, it just does not have them. Uh, I think by default it puts something like a 1 or 0.1 for the astrometric uncertainty instead of like 0.01. Therefore the QA calculator just collapses, rejects it. And yeah. So yeah, you do a run and you don't have any Q3 high quality Meteors, but actually you do. <laughs> yeah, so I think in some of the Alex, it's basically it's a it's a it's a symptom of the fact that you're using UFO orbit software to analyze data that originated from a different software platform. Yeah. So I, yeah. I guess the RMS um, orbit calculator itself is fine internally. It's when it's trying to share data with with the other systems. Is that right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah as, a, as a short answer, yeah, I would say that. Okay, I like short <laughs> answers because we're almost out of time. So I'll, I'll just ask the uh, the last question, which is Jack Martin's question, which I think uh, is one of those how long is a piece of string uh, questions, but I'll ask it anyway, Bill. How good is the signal to noise ratio of your spectra? 
And how long is a piece of string? Yeah. Exactly. Uh, it's 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 imp- again, it's impossible to say definitively uh, in terms of of the spectrum because it depends on the spectrum itself. How bright the meteor is? Uh, is it a high high altitude one? Is it a low altitude one? There's also an element of the intrinsic uh, bit depth of the camera. For example, the Vortex I use just use eight-bit frame grabbers, so they're going to have a slightly less signal-to-noise with an equivalent spectrum anyway. I've started to use some ZWO cameras which have 12-bit depth. So with a given spectrum, they would just give you a better signal-to-noise anyway because you get greater digitization depth. Uh, so in terms of numbers, the Vortex can come out anywhere from 2 to about 10 over the kind of base of the noise by the time you integrate it and do the binning through visual spec. Uh, this nice one in the background there, uh, those, those lines are maybe 10 to 20 times above the noise. So it just it depends on the brightness of the spectrum. That's the yeah, short answer. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's great. Okay, thank you very much to the, the three of you. That's been really interesting. And we've had lots of comments as well on the chat as how many people found that interesting. And I think... Um, Lots of people are thinking about setting up systems like this. And so uh, you, you've made people think a lot and encourage them to, to go and do that. So thank you very much. Um, I'll draw this to a close now. Just uh, note that the next uh, BA webinar is the historical section webinar, which is due on Saturday, November the 21st. So hopefully you'll be uh, around to watch that. Um, this has been recorded. It'll be on YouTube uh, shortly if you want to watch it again or if you've missed it or if you missed the beginning. Um, so um, thank you very much for watching. Cheers. Indeed. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.